Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's Word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. The Lord, He is the Good Shepherd. John, chapter I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks around or over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going directly through the gate is a thief and they're a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. After he was gathering all of his flock, he walks before them, ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice. They'll flee and run from him because they don't know his voice. Verse 14 of John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We were in Greece on the Aegean Sea. My wife and three children spent a week on a Greek island off the coast of Turkey. The island is very famous for those that have a Bible. For John the Apostle, who penned the words of Revelation, was on that island when God gave him the revelation. Well, we were there for the entire week. I made my way to the north shore of this very, very small island. It was different than the south and the east and the west. For some reason, it was very, very windy. And the wind had carved into the side of the island these enormous cliffs. The cliffs were actually quite dangerous. They reminded me of the Northern California coast. A favorite spot of mine is to hike around Fort Bragg. How many of you have been to Fort Bragg? And those cliffs north of Fort Bragg, all the way up to Westport. They are chiseled out, literally, by the wind. On the north shore, where those cliffs were, I was hiking around when I came across a shepherd. He had a large herd. I noticed that there was no fence protecting the sheep from going over the edge. Along Fort Bragg, every year someone falls off one of those bluffs. Occasionally, someone will literally perish from the fall. I saw the sheep, and I saw the shepherd. I was curious on such a small island why no one had built a fence. Later, I was speaking to the shepherd as he was in the field, and I crossed path on my morning hike. And I asked him, how come you don't have a fence out here to protect your herd? You and I like to build a fence. If you go to the Midwest, one of the odd things, people don't have fences like they do in California. How many people from the Midwest? Many people know what I'm talking about. No fences. In California, if you have an enormous ranch, you build a fence. If you go to Loomis and you have a five-acre parcel, you build a fence. If you have a residential home with a 10,000 square foot plot, you build a fence. If you have a little bitty place, you build a fence. We love 
fences. They protect us and make us feel safe. Legalism is like a fence. The Ten Commandments can be difficult to read. Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. That's the law. That's legalism. No, 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 no. Offense. The law causes people to rebel against it. The law limits our freedom, we feel. I just want to be out on the side of the bluff. I want to look out over the ocean and not have a fence. I don't want to think about legalism. But the question is, what's going to keep you safe if there's no fence? And that's the question that I ask the shepherd. God doesn't give us a fence. He gives us the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the shepherd told me, the sheep will never go over to the flock. They'll never, never go across. And if one went, the others would follow, and he could lose his own herd, but he wasn't worried. He said, the sheep listen to his voice, and because they hear his voice and they know he's there, they never wander off to the side. Can somebody say amen? We're not talking about the law. We're not talking about the bondage of legalism. We're talking about the gentle voice of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. First Kings chapter 19 tells the story of Elijah. He had a great visitation of the Holy Spirit. God did miracle signs and wonders. He'd have been at Mount Carmel and he was in a kind of a competition with all of these false prophets and, and God consumed the sacrifice and fire came down and licked up the wet sacrifice. Incredible story. Very next chapter, chapter 19 of 1 Kings. He's defeated. He's blue and overwhelmed. He's unhappy. I'm all alone. I'm the only guy serving God. Nobody else is there. I'm the last. He wasn't true. But in his heart, he thought he was the only one walking with God. Did you know that suicide among clergy is most common on a Monday morning? They preach fire on Sunday, and the deepest darkest part of a clergy's entire week is Monday morning. But did you know that more suicides in general happen on Monday morning because we all face exactly the same thing, another week of the grind, and here we go, and I'm depleted, and I don't know if I can go forward. Elijah hears from God. He is saying to God, God, where are you? What are you doing? I can't feel you. I can't hear you. People don't like me. They're trying to kill me. And he just have a big self-pity heart. God said, I want you to go to the mountain because I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you. He went to the mountain. You know the story? The wind came by. God said, I'm not in the wind. An earthquake shook. God said, I'm not in the earthquake. A fire came. And God said, I'm not in the earthquake. And then there was that small, gentle voice. You know it best, quoted from memory, the small, still voice of God. The wind in the desert. Can you hear that small, still voice? Your life is exactly like this cup. It's exactly like this cup. I started using straws years ago, and I, I, I order a cup of coffee, I'll put a straw in it. I'll order a glass of water, I'll put a straw in it. People say, well, that's ridiculous. How in the world did you learn how to drink hot coffee with a straw? 
Well, what happened was is I was come place one time and I was having some hot coffee or something. Maybe it could have been a soda pop. I messed up my tie getting some coffee all over my tie. I was drinking it and it just I just it just got there. I've wrecked shirts and ties and sports jackets. So I discovered if I use a straw, I'm not going to spill it. And so I, I, I'll just have this straw right here. And whatever's on the inside, I, I enjoy it. And I was thinking about that the other day. And I was thinking, wow, here you are walking with God. And, and God has his straw inside of your heart. Then you get some responsibility. And other people come along. And they start putting a straw in your life. <laughs> And then the government comes along, and, and I'm going to put all the straws in there because that's the government. I mean, you get you get the city, the county, the state, the federal, the global tax. You get you get your your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, your mother, your your neighbor. You got all of these people and all of these things, and they're all, and they're all got their straw inside of you. Now, now, God. God is there, and, and you can't see this probably. If you have eyes like me, you can't see it. This, this is my favorite straw. It's clear. You can't see it. It's my favorite. I'm going to put it right there, and maybe you can or maybe you can't see it, but there's God is in your cup too, and God is speaking to you as the shepherd speaks to the heart of the sheep. But you can't hear the Lord because everybody else and his brother, they're speaking to you too. I notice there's two kinds of people in the world today and in my life. This person has a handful of seeds. And this person has a handful of seeds. And they come and they drop stuff in my cup. They have access to my cup because they're a straw in my life. And, and they're just pouring whatever they have in their hand. Last winter it was raining and, and storms. And, and I came to church and I... And you're so sweet. I gave you California poppy seeds, thousands and thousands. And I asked you, I invited you to go out and spread them in antelope. Sometimes people that speak into our lives, they're holding a handful of poppy seeds. And, and they, they bring words that have a fragrance and, and they're so beautiful and that's what you did and today people call me and tell me pastor I was going down Antelope I was going down Don Julio I was going down Alberta and I was on one avenue and I saw California poppies popping up it's because you took those seeds and you planted them all over the place but not everybody is carrying California poppy seeds I run into it all the life all, all, all the time pray and I walk and I go, oh God, I, I want to hear from your voice. And, and then I'll come and somebody's got a handful of seeds and they look just like your seeds. But they're weeds. Somebody say amen. And you've given them access to the cup of your soul. And with that straw connected, they just start pulling those seeds, pouring those seeds. And they're weeds careful what straw you allow in this cup. Be careful of what you allow in this cup. I was at the American River with my tie up. I left before sunrise and set into the river and the river was still. It's really something when the temperatures run in the 80 and you're along this river and it's so cold. The river comes across Folsom Dam and it's, it's from the snow melt in the Sierra. So you have these warm temperatures and cold water and the reaction is this mist. So I'm out in the lagoon watching the birds and the, the river otters or something when there's even deer and you see raccoons and beavers. It's really something. You don't see them at 2 in the afternoon, but you'll see them at 6 a.m. And they're all out there and they're in the mist. And it, and it's like, I was like, oh, God, I'm just going to take this and I'm going to take this straw and I'm going to take this straw and I gotta go to the, I'm going to go to the river and I'm going to sit in the kayak and it's going to be real still and I'm going to watch the sun come up. And you know what? It's so easy to hear God when God's the only one that can hide it. Somebody say amen. It's so easy to hear the voice of the shepherd. There are people walking, talking about the weeds in their life. I've 
the same thing, that they don't have fragrance and they don't have life. You're walking around and you're having that with Jesus. And the, you're hit with a, it's like, you know why? It's not in the earthquake. It's not in the fire. It's not in the wind. It's in that small, still voice. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And he speaks to our hearts. When we make ourselves available and accessible to him, he'll put his straw right there and he will speak to your heart. He will give to you that life and that fragrance, that edification and exhortation inside of your spirit. All of a sudden you find that you have strength that you've never had before. You have faith and peace that you've never had before. And where did it come from? It came from that still, small voice. The shepherd on the island of the Aegean Sea called Patmos had a little local church that was right there. They came on the side. I was still just beside him. I would watch him, and he would put his hand inside of me, the drip, and he would touch my feet. I said, what do you have in that pouch? It was oil. It was oil. I don't mean 30-weight motor oil. It was an olive oil. And what happens is the sheep are out in the field, and in the field where the grass is tall, there's a lot of critters like ticks, mosquitoes, gnats, every creepy crawling flying thing is out there in that field. And he would stick his hand inside this pouch when he saw an uncomfortable sheep. And he would go over and he would start caressing the sheep on the head, maybe the back. I even would watch him and he would kneel down and take a leg and lift it up. And he was taking this oil and rubbing the leg of the sheep. He later explained to me two things. He said, number one, did you know, and I'm going to translate it for us on Sunday morning, did you know that the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit will protect your thin skin? Do you know? That when you are bathed in the anointing oil that only comes from on high, and when you allow him to, to flow and allow yourself to be dripping in the anointing of the oil that comes from heaven, all of those ticks and all of those gnats and all of those things, what did mama say? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but w words will never hurt me? How is that possible that people bump into each other and they do different things and they annoy you and frustrate you and yet in the midst of it all, you have a peace. It didn't come from the world. It came from heaven. The shepherd carries a pouch of anointing oil. and If you will just stop running from God, if you'll stop running from God and just move closer and closer to the shepherd. My little boy fell off his tricycle in our cul-de-sac. Mommy, 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 it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. He's out there with something in a little tube chasing the little guy. Come here, let me put this on there. Come here. It's going to hurt until I put this on there running in circles. It's crazy. He's yelling and screaming and she's trying to help him and he won't sit, stand still. And some of you are just like my little boy. You're running away from God. He's trying to put oil on you and you're running away from God. I came outside. He saw me. He stopped dead in his tracks. She hated that little boy. She'd yell. He'd run. I'd just show up. She'd be watching him. She didn't know I was going like this. Every time I grabbed my black belt and go like that, he'd stop on a dime. She didn't see that. He finally stopped. She put it on there, and he melted like butter. 
Oh, mom, that feels so good. Well, son, why did you run? Oh, I needed that. If we would move towards the shepherd, if you would just snuggle up in your prayer closet in the arms of Jesus, you would discover inside of his couch is the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? I feel all alone. I feel depressed. I feel distressed. I feel distressed. I, I just can't go on. I cannot. And there he's got in his pouch everything the sheep needs. The odd thing the shepherd told me about the oil is how powerful it was at dealing with all those annoying insects. But he also explained to me that the oil would also heal. Somebody say amen. When you snuggle up to Jesus in your prayer closet, with all of the sickness and all of the migraines and all of the headaches and all of the tummy aches and all of the pains and all of the joints, you're sitting there in the arms of Jesus and you stand up and for the first time your knees don't work, hurt, your ears don't create pain. All of a sudden, you didn't ask him to heal you, but because you were in his presence, you were healed. You were touched. I'm talking about the voice of the shepherd. I'm talking about Jesus. calls us to listen to him. How he calls us not to go over the cliff, but to follow his voice. I wonder the disciples got a few more seconds to call him along. He explained in his own words who had become his friends. They started getting him to do things he didn't want to do, and every time with them, they were doing these bad things and they would talk him into doing them. He found himself deeper and deeper and deeper in trouble. He rededicated his life to the Lord. I saw him come down the other day. He told me how you're doing. He messaged me and something like this. My friends called. I took him out of my cup. My friends called. I took him out of my cup. My family called. I took him out of my cup. The last week, his life has dramatically changed. I did not do anything. I did not say anything. God did it all. Today, he has one straw inside of his cup. He is listening to the voice of the shepherd as he follows the shepherd. One day he was a little boy and he was a shepherd. He grew up, he killed a giant, became the king. The little boy that was a shepherd as a kid would write Psalm 23. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse, verse 1 of Psalms 23. On my morning prayer walk today, I do five miles through the city six days a week, and then once a week I try to get in and climb a mountain somewhere. Today, I'm in the city, and I'm walking five miles. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm stumbling down Alberta. I come to Don Julio, and when I do, I remember this road is closed. I love walking through that area, trying to see what's going on in the construction. And as I was going through it, I noticed the road had been completely redone and was now open for through traffic. Oh, wow, I'm glad I went this way. I didn't know that. And the further I walked, I saw all of the new homes they put in there, hundreds and hundreds of them, and I saw the new road that they had just finished. But then I had this thought. And the thought that I had was, I've lived in this area for 30 years. And I used to drive up and down Don Julio all the time. I lived right around the corner. I'd come down North Loop, make a right onto Don Julio, and then I'm on the freeway in just a short moment. 
But when they closed it down, I had to go through the busiest accident infested stoplight in our whole community. And I didn't like that. And when I saw that road this morning, I thought to myself, I'm glad they fixed it. But there was nothing wrong with the road. I'm going to say that again because I don't want you to miss it. I've walked that road many, many times. From Antelope or Alberta all the way down to North Loop. There was nothing wrong with Don Julio. Nothing. It was a fairly new road. It was a wide road. It was a good road. I used it all the time. But they went in there with big bulldozers and they destroyed that road. They turned it upside down. They tore it off. They closed the thing down. Nobody could even go that way. What in the world is wrong with our city leaders to take a brand new road and destroy it and then repave it? That's so messed up. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it isn't messed up. Maybe they wanted to put in 600 brand new homes in Antelope, but before they could, they had to put in a new gas line, a new sewer line, a new telephone line, a new electric. They had all of these utilities that they had to do. So you know what they did? They tore up something good so that something else could expand. Now, you're going to miss this, so I'm going to say it again. They tore up something good so they could expand something bigger. In our lives, we'll look at something. God, the shepherd, begins working on it. He begins taking it apart, and we're holding on with all of our might. No, 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 no. God is trying to deal, drill down, trying to tear off the pavement, trying to get deep into the earth, trying to get deep into your soul so that he can do a brand new thing in your life and in your family. But we're holding on to the past. And the shepherd says, let it go, let it go, let it go. I'm going to repave this once again. But right now, I need to put something on the inside that nobody on the outside will ever be able to see. Oh, yes, when you drive by, you see all those brand new homes. Oh, you see them all. The new lawn, the new paint, the new roof. Oh, beautiful homes. But what you don't see is somebody had to go in there and tear up a perfectly good street so that that housing process project could expand. And in my life, we say together, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's Word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others.